This is a session with a difference. It has been developed by a group of HIV leaders living with and affected by HIV, most of whom have been prominent activists for over 20 years and are well respected in the field and who now represent an impressive myriad of significant organizations. The session will throw light on an extremely neglected and yet critical issue for true empowerment of communities and for successful HIV programs. Self-stigma or what we sometimes call internal stigma. Self-stigma needs to be understood and un addressed in its own right. From over 50 PLHIV stigma index reports in all regions of the world, almost all report high levels of self-stigma ranging from 20% to 75% manifesting in beliefs and feelings of shame, blame, fear and denial. And I'm sure it is just not in the HIV world but each one of us has battled with self-stigma and internal stigma. In India particularly, sometimes we are brought up with things that I am wrong here, this is wrong, I am no good. There is so much of shame inside us and very often we fight with it not even understanding or realizing that it is there. This issue is under-recognized, under-researched and imperfectly understood and yet plays an immensely powerful role in silencing us and keeping us fearful, ashamed and blocks us from testing, treatment, self-acceptance and support. We have a luminary of panelists with us here, Masimba from ZNNP Plus, Sean Mellers from International HIV AIDS Alliance, Claudi Farikal from again ZNNP Plus Zimbabwe, Sophie positively UK, Benjamin from Reshape, Jogen Rupadhyay from GAP India. The session is co-hosted by Work for Change, International HIV AIDS Alliance, Global Network of People Living with HIV, European AIDS Treatment Group, ProCare, Zimbabwe National Network of People Living with HIV, IHP or ESHAPE, Connect, Positively UK, AIDS Society of India, Vote for Health, Centre for Supporting Community Development Initiatives and Citizen News Service. I now request Masimba to please share with us whatever he wants to share. This is a very open and informal session and it will be run by all of us collectively <coughs> together. In 2014, uh, as a country, we completed our Zimbabwe Stigma Index Survey, um, which had um, quite some interesting results. And um, part of those results uh, were showing higher levels of uh, self-stigma among its people living with HIV. Actually, it was, it was around 39% of people living with HIV who were, who were talked to. They, 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 they were showing levels, higher levels of um, self-stigma. Um, the study f uh, interviewed a total of 1,905 people. These included uh, prisoners, these included uh, MSM, these included uh, sex workers, and people living with HIV. And uh, our findings on self-stigma in Zimbabwe were not, are not just peculiar to Zimbabwe. Uh, across uh, the other stigma index research studies done uh, under GNP+, Plus, ours was the 53rd. And the results consistently were showing that uh, people living with HIV self-stigmatize. In South Africa, they did their study, which was the biggest, with over 10,000 people. And results were showing that there are over 45% uh, st uh, self-stigma. In Rwanda, it was around 45%. Uh, Asia, Pacific countries, some nine countries, between 54 and 75%, higher levels of self-stigma. So the findings are very uh, consistent. but. One thing that, my, that was uh, not coming out clearly in all those uh, studies was um, clear recommendations to say, how then do we go about it? How do we uh, address self-stigma among people living with HIV? We were seeing a lot of recommendations to address stigma in the church, in the work settings, in the community, but there was nothing really uh, recommended for addressing self-stigma. 
does with support uh, from uh, Troke, which uh, is the official development development agents of the Catholic Church in Ireland. Um, we did a, a pilot study, which is called inquiry-based stress reduction. Um, initially, we began with uh, two people, then we grew to 13. Uh, the inquiry-based stress reduction uh, is a self-inquiry methodology that revolves around the wake of uh, one Byron Katie, an American. Um, the methodology revolves around four questions, uh, which are, I, I will try to share with you in a, in a summarized manner. But uh, please, this is just for sharing because uh, we need a lot of uh, practice and uh, introspection to make it work. So the idea is you find uh, one stressful thought at a time uh, that is worrying you. For example, it, it might be issues of rejection. You were rejected or I was rejected by my, my spouse. So that becomes a stressful thought that um, he or she rejected me. So when we apply the methodology, uh, you, you ask yourself, one, is it true that he or she rejected you? Then you do a lot of introspection and inquiry about that, trying to think whether you were really rejected or not. Then the next question is, I, can you absolutely tell uh, whether, whether it's true that you were rejected? So again, you are supposed to do a lot of inquiry into the circumstances that you are calling uh, maybe rejection. Uh, and for, from practice, uh, we have realized that the first question, most people say, yes, I was rejected, but is it true that you were rejected? Then you, you, you start seeing people making uh, different now uh, answers to the first one. So I'm saying, uh, maybe he didn't really reject me. Maybe he was not. So uh, things start changing from question number two. Then at question number three, you say, uh, what kind of a person who would you be with that thought that I was rejected? Who would you be and how do you react? Knowing that or believing that I was re rejected, what kind of reaction do you do? What kind of a person are you? Maybe you talk of um, frustrated, embarrassed, down, you don't want to interact with anyone, etc. Then the fourth question, the last one is, uh, what kind of a person would you be without the thought that I was rejected? So we are trying to remove uh, in your mind the thought that I was rejected and how would you uh, be in such a situation? And then after that, we do what are called uh, turnarounds. We find some genuine specific reasons, uh, that, uh, specific examples that apply uh, to the opposite of uh, the statement, he rejected me. Maybe this, the first one is um, he didn't reject me. So you find you try to find other uh, genuine examples in your life where with that person or with your spouse, the the statement he didn't reject you applies, and uh, that is worked. At, uh, at three months and six month intervals um, with uh, the people that we have worked with, the results have been so impressive. Uh, in terms of uh, daily work, in terms of satisfaction, in terms of even uh, issues of depression. So in a nutshell, these are the uh, interventions that we have done so far to address uh, self-stigma. We are in the process of developing a pool of what we call facilitators who will be able to uh, facilitate this kind of a methodology to support groups of people living with HIV. And uh, another issue is also uh, its, ap its applicability is not only limited to HIV. When we borrowed it from uh, Byron Katie International, it was not being applied to HIV. It was just being applied to stressful thoughts. So in our, in our scenario, we've um, received a lot of um, interest from key population groups and from uh, players who are working in the gender-based uh, violence sector. Thank you. I think listening to Masimba um, and challenging those notions of rejection 
there was a time when I was the person who was rejecting me. Um, and I think growing up in a very conservative uh, Christian family um, and discovering my own sexuality at a, at a very young age, um, when I was diagnosed as being HIV positive, all those feelings of being bad, being evil, being promiscuous, being sinful came to the fore because that's what my community thought of people with HIV, that you were promiscuous, that you were bad. And so I, I was carrying all these negative feelings and these negative sentiments um, of society for a very long time. Um, I think it's a real struggle to address self-stigma. Um, and I think it's in many ways harder than living with HIV. Um, because for HIV, I can take a pull. Um, I can't take a pull for self-stigma. Um, because self-stigma is constant work and sometimes painful work and exploration and being able to understand and find um, allies or options in how you, how I am able to address some of those um, issues is at times very, very difficult and very painful. Um, and I, th I think often when you hear the labels um, faggot or AIDS victim or AIDS patient, um, it pushes a nerve, it pushes a button and no matter how much work you do, no matter how confident you feel in yourself. It, for me, it always tends to break me down, break me down, break me down, break me down. And um, being able to look at myself now, um, when at the age of almost 51, um, I'm okay. Um, I'm, uh, yes, I'm a HIV positive faggot, as some people think, but it's easier to say that compared to what it was 15, 20, or even 30 years ago. Thank you so much. And I think you brought a very good point about the sort of words which we have started using in our common parlance, like a patient, victim, uh, rather than saying that we are just people living with, we live with so many other things. And uh, so we are living or we are surviving, which in itself is a big thing rather than put those labels which we somehow inadvertently it has cropped up. And I would just like to share that at CNS we are very particular about the language which we use for any one of us. Like, not just uh, somebody who is living with a disease but others as well in society. And in India we have that sort of a very different type of language being used for the underprivileged or can only say we are specially abled or not even differently able, but there may be some specially abled people. So I think we have to keep that in mind because inadvertently we strike some very raw nerve there. Uh, Cloudy? Um, as yet, the moderator say, my name is Cloud Farikai. Um, I'm HIV positive. And um, I would like to say a few words about stigma as well. Well, I would like to start by saying that um, the fight against uh, stigma begins with us. Why do I say so? Because most of the time we find that we are our own worst enemies because of the self-stigma that we are addressing right now. Because the moment you start looking down upon yourself, you disempower yourself from uh, being able to fight the external stigma that you face in life. So to me, self-stigma is the um, most dangerous or the most powerful forms of stigma that if you are able to overcome that, then whatever the other people will say, you will be able to overcome that. Yeah. I was also a victim of uh, self-stigma and denial when I was diagnosed, diag diagnosed of HIV. Um, I blamed myself. I blamed even God. Why did it happen to me? Why me? Why not to uh, other people? You see? 
But um, as time went, went on, um, through various steps of counseling, I, I, I underwent counseling before we, I did IBSR. And um, well, counseling helps. It did help me. It was a stepping stone for me. But uh, to me, um, IBSR is more powerful than counseling. Why do I say so? Counseling is like uh, you have a professional, you tell him your problems, and he tells you how to solve your problems. But with IBSR, you are the own solver of your own problems. You don't need someone to help you solve your problems. And to me, it's more long lasting. And with IBSR, you don't need to visit a professional counselor. You can do it in your own home. You can do it anyway, even when you're walking through the road, in the road. So to me, IBSR is so easy. It's a powerful tool to fight social stigma than uh, counseling. And uh, it has worked for me. Um, when I started uh, doing uh, the work of Byron Katie, I looked at the four questions. Uh, is, uh, is it true? Can you absolutely know that is true? Who would you be uh, without, without the thoughts? Or uh, how do you react? How do you feel when you believe that thought? I thought, ah, this is so simple. But if um, you continue, doing the work, you find that the simplicity of the work is, in fact, its power. Because uh, the work itself, it um, allows you to introspect, to meditate within yourself, to ask yourself, to know that uh, you, as a person, you are enough as you are. Yeah. You don't need uh, to seek approval from other people. You don't need to seek love if, to, uh, from other people if they don't want to give it to you. Yeah. The moment you start uh, trying to please the world, that's when you start to get lost. Yeah. Because I always say this every time I, uh, I, I do interviews, I always say this, that yeah, you can never, ever satisfy all the people all the time. So it is better that you do what you like, and when you do what you like, you shall find the people who like what you like, and they'll be your friends, and they'll help you through the way to fight stigma. So to me, um, as I did the work of Byron Katie, and uh, I, did, I worked through many stressful thoughts, uh, most of them, like uh, I, I had many fears that maybe I wouldn't even see my children finish school, that I would, um, uh, the ARVs would not work for me, and things like that. I worked on all those fears. But you see that when you ask that, is it true that you won't see your children finish school? You find that you don't know. They are just thoughts that are coming through your mind. And the, those thoughts, if you attach yourself to those thoughts that surely I won't, because I'm HIV positive, I won't be able to see my, my children finish school then you are, you are a stressed person. Yeah. So the work of Byron Katie basically makes us see that most of the things that cause, uh, or, or most of the stress that we face in life are assumed thoughts that we have, which we are not even sure of. Who knows that I, 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 how long I am going to live? Nobody. That's God's business. That's not my business. But the moment I start thinking that well, maybe tomorrow I might fall sick and I whatever, or maybe if I disclose my status to my relatives, they uh, might shun me, they might uh, will laugh at me, whatever. I'm already self-stigmatizing myself. So basically I think the war against the stigma can only be won if we destigmatize ourselves. By that I mean if we fight self-stigma, which is within us, and then we'll be able to face the world with no guilty conscience, then you'll be empowered as well. That whatever the other people will say, it's what everyone is entitled to his or her opinion, you know? If someone says, well, I don't like the trousers you are wearing, but I like it, who cares? What's more important? It's me who is important. I like wearing the trousers I'm wearing. That's why I wore it. I'm not here to please you. You see? So, 
it took me a long time to reach where I am, uh, but uh, through doing the work of Byron Katie, I think I have been empowered and I've been enlightened. And that enlightenment really uh, it showed, even in my family, because I used to be withdrawn, even at home. I wouldn't maybe talk to my kids. I would be someone who was uh, quiet. And um, even when I went to health centers, I was, the inferiority complex was always with me. But uh, the moment I started doing the work, I knew that I was equal to everyone else, HIV or no HIV. Who knows, when we finish this um, uh, conference, or even before we finish this, this conference, as we walk out today, someone is, uh, smashed by a car. So it doesn't necessarily mean that when you, if you're HIV positive, it's a death sentence. Yeah, death doesn't come through that, that, that way only. There are many things that can kill people, and many people who laughed at me, that this is my testimony, there are many people who used to laugh and mock me and treat me as, um, as dead. But where are they? They are dead. I'm still living. And I've got many more years to go. So, <laughs> with my HIV, <laughs> yeah, I can still manage it. And, um, well, I'd like to say thanks to Byron Katie for introducing this tool, this methodology of um, the work of, um, uh, we call it IBSR or inquiry based stress reduction, because it showed me that I can always work on my stress and remove it myself and live a stress-free life. And also, when I do that, I destigmatize myself as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so proud of you because you brought up such a good point that all our life is spent in thinking, what will others say or what will others think or what will society think? Forgetting everything. For me, that society is who is happy when you are sad and sad when you are happy. So it's better that live for ourselves. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, hi, good afternoon everyone. Um, my name is Sophie Strachan. Uh, I'm from the UK um, and uh, <laughs> work for an organisation called Positively UK. Um, so I, early on in um, my years of living with HIV, um, I did identify with self-stigma and it was fundamentally it resurfaced a belief that actually was the same as what Sean said is, is that I, I carried this belief and I don't know where it came from that I'm fundamentally a bad person at the core of my being and so the shame that I felt um, at, at, uh, at my diagnosis um, was very raw at, at the beginning and, and, I, and I also didn't understand why I had these feelings of guilt and I personally have done a lot of things in my, in my 13 years of living with HIV to reach a place of self-acceptance and not be as impacted as I was in those early years as somebody living with HIV. And my, my introduction to, um, I say my introduction, I, through my work at Positively UK, I was, uh, running a children and family project and and I kept hearing about stigma and I and I kept observing how the um, within a family dynamic they they weren't talking there wasn't the telling another family member about their HIV and and so I at the same time was introduced to Nadine Ferris uh, and her work that she done on self stigma and I designed a workshop that I continue to deliver to, de to, de to deliver today to people living with HIV and I and it was very important that it was something that they could walk away from feeling more educated and more empowered as a person living with HIV and I and I called it overcoming self stigma with love and compassion and it was to enable these people living with HIV to walk away with tools beyond that session that they could apply in their daily life. And, and 
one of them was um, an NLP exercise and it's as others have mentioned it was about working on people's belief systems and for some of us like myself and like Sean was saying it had it had reignited negative core beliefs that I'd held about myself and 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 for some it was for some it was a light uh, sort of like a real light bulb moment in 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 identifying the self stigma that they had been walking around and learning about the impact that that had been having on their life. Some, as I said, from point of diagnosis, and I've and I've accustomed the um, the workshop in also working with uh, key populations. So I did one with a colleague around gay men, and it says it's been mentioned. It was what I call multiple identities, so as a, an HIV positive person, as a gay man or a lesbian woman or a bisexual woman. Um, in the UK I also relate it to migrants and the level of uh, stigma and discrimination that they experience. So multiple identities and multiple layers of stigma and it was giving them this space where they could work on um, more than one belief basically. But it was also um, about changing that negative belief and for them to explore what it what they would have to let go of by changing that belief and what was the impact of walking around with that negative belief what could they gain by letting go of that negative belief and i'll give examples of self-love and self-worth self-acceptance integrity one of the things that I've struggled with and I hear other people struggling with is uh, the incongruence in my life, having a double life, being open in the sector and yet not having any of my family members know for quite a number of years. So if I look at the values that I was brought up with and about how it was important to be honest, although the dishonesty was as a form of self-protection, it still didn't sit comfortably with me. So the freedom that I got through the self-acceptance and over the years being able to tell other people, as I said, was like really freeing. Um, and it's like others have said, it's sort of the unconscious or the conscious roles that we can play as people in our lives, which actually can have nothing to do with our HIV. Um, but because of societal stigma, because of how we can internalize that, um, we can walk around identifying as a victim. So again, it was about giving people tools that, that they would feel liberated by, that they realised that they didn't have to be a victim. And, and through some work um, on gaining some self-acceptance, that's when I got the real freedom. It doesn't mean that I'm not impacted by somebody directly discriminating me because that has been my experience but what I'm able to do and this is what I say to the participants in the workshop is it's not your shame to carry about you need to hand it back to society it's not your shame and I as I said I got real freedom from that um, other tools that I gave them was um, mindfulness was teaching them how to practice mindfulness to help them become aware of their emotions so they could process it their thought process um, and it's another mindfulness tool but it again it was about in the awareness of their thoughts it was looking for the good stuff as well in their day-to-day -day life um, so yeah, it, the self stigma, as I said, is not something I'd identify with today, but in the work that I do in London, I go into clinics, I see it. I see people not engaging in life because of the, what they're walking around and carrying. And, and, and it's important that we can educate people in, in how, to change, how, to, how to change that. Thank you, Sophie, and very well said. We now have Benjamin sharing. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Um, um, I'm with International HIV Partnerships, uh, which helps people build partnerships. I'm also uh, in a think tank in London called Reshape, which is about reshaping the response to HIV, hepatitis C, and related sexual and mental health concerns. And in that context, I was happy and very pleased to have met with Nadine Ferris France. And uh, through that, I met uh, Sean. I've worked with Sophie. 
uh, around this very, very um, interesting issue of self or internalized stigma. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to just talk about three snapshots. Uh, the first snapshot is my early days uh, in HIV. I became, I'm 68 years old, I became HIV positive in 1981. I knew it because I had uh, the first, uh, you know, sickness. I was pretty sure I had it and then when the test became available, I was living in San Francisco, I had lots of mates who uh, thought the same and we actually made deals, very verbal upfront deals <clears throat> that we would go get tested and that we would disclose. And that was it, we did it. And. Uh, as a group, as a team, we figured out that we would disclose to our family members, and it was done. You know, and that was in like 1986, done. So the idea of being self-stigmatized around HIV just doesn't register to me. What I did do, though, is similar to what Mosimba's been, talk Mosimba's been talking about and other people have been talking about, is I engaged in a very long process of therapeutic interventions. I could not help but see myself as a really manipulative person. I really discounted myself, I was controlling, and I was controlling and manipulative because I was very aware that if I was open, we're talking 1950s in a small town in the United States, if I was open about being gay, if I was open about being, dis if I was open about being different in any kind of way, I would really have been in danger. So yes, my life really was around manipulation and I had to hand it back, as Sophie said so well. So I did a lot, a lot of therapy and I actually be, ended up sort of winning. I, I really have done well in my life. I've had a, a lover husband for 24 years now. I'm happy in my work. Second snapshot happened a few months ago. Gary, Sophie and I were at a, something called the patient's journey. We were talking about sex with African women and gay men. And this African woman pointed out, she said, you have to understand there's a confusion right now. If you're new to HIV, what you, the message you get from your doctor is that, oh, you're gonna be fine, take the pills, get out of here, you'll be fine. She says it's not true. The fact of the matter is you have to spend years learning how to be an HIV positive person. It's a journey and there's everyone's responsibility and opportunity to do that. There's lots of available stuff. Uh, at that meeting was a, a young Arab uh, Londoner. He told me that he could not possibly be gay, HIV positive, and an Arab in open situation. I said, that's ridiculous. I re told him about people, Arab, gay, HIV positive men that I know all over the world. And I literally brought the woman back and begged her to explain it again. He did, she did, and he could not hear it. He could not hear it. And I said, guy, you're sophisticated. Do some Google. You know, I gave him some names of organizations. He can Google, and anybody here can Google, but they don't Google the stuff that they need to for their own self-worth. Self the, the final s s snapshot is about Brexit. Uh, many of you know that Joe Cox got killed. Uh, a, a really good person got killed by a right winger. As a foreigner in the United Kingdom, I really couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, and as it became aware that Brexit was going to win, as you said in your earlier presentation, I felt shame, blame, fear, and denial. I'm a foreigner now. I used to be a Londoner. Now I'm a foreigner. And I finally went, I couldn't figure out why I felt so terrible. And so many of my friends felt so terrible. And it was actually an unprotected attack from stigma. I was completely unprotected. Uh, labor parties, nobody really fought for, for this. And the take home message for me is the importance of safe places. We really do need to have places where we do feel connected with people. A lot of my British friends really came forward and really connected with me. We're doing things like, what are you gonna do when you're on the bus and somebody attacks somebody? Because this is going on. So we're actually playing games, preparatory games, to take care of each other. And 
I know that there's a, the, the work that has been so well described by Masimba, but it can really be distilled down to personal actions. What are you going to do in your next step when something happens that makes you feel bad, less than, or you see it happening to another person? And just so you know, the lesson is you don't go against the attacker, you go with the person being attacked and you spend time with them and the attacker goes away. So it's building our strength rather than trying to fight the other thing. That's an important message. Thank you very much. And this is what is happening today in all spheres of uh, society and life. Yeah. They are becoming, they are becoming more intolerant. Uh, we now have our last speaker is, but not the least, Jogendra Upadhyay from GAP India. Myself, Jogendra Upadhyay. I from GAP organization in state of Gujarat, India. My organization work with the children and adolescents living with HIV for total quality care, of, care and support. I sharing the my experience with the stigma and discrimination among children living with HIV. Uh, my organization start in 2010 is a one project name is Bal Gopal. Bal Gopal program in the big city Ahmedabad and rural area in the Gujarat state. Bal Gopal means children 0 to 13 years and Bal Mukul means adolescence above 14 years. In the Bal Gopal name is Lord Krishna according to the Indian mythology. The family background of the CLHIV are 80% from poor family. Among the 57 CLH, 50% CLHIV are orphan, semi-orphan status. They live with their grandparents and relatives. The CLHIV face stigma and discrimination from family, society, and school. This discrimination does not understand, but they feel, therefore, they create adverse situation of the CLHIV life. Girl child CLHIV discrimination by her HIV status and gender. I have a case study. I had visited one family in May 2016. Then I observed brother and sister, both are HIV reactive and both are eligible to ART. Family decided for boys can start ART, but they cannot start treatment for girls. Grandmother said to me, we can start treatment for boys because he is a male child. But girl child is the burden of our family, so better see they died early. The experience of discrimination in the childhood are the adolescents lead to the self-stigma. Is a negative effect for the keeping adherence, education, and development. Development. We have also observed approximately 50% CLHIV has suffered from the dental problem in India. Sometimes this has the discrimination discriminated from the dental treatment. This is my uh, experience uh, work with the children living with HIV AIDS HIV in India. Well, and, uh, 
I am sharing one experience of mine. I am from the southeastern part of India, southeastern coastal part of India. From my place, there is a lot of huge migration. People are, people, young people, particularly the young male, they are migrating to urban cities of Gujarat and Mumbai. Uh, they migrate alone. Single male migration is there. Uh, the, 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 the difference in migration is that they migrate at the age of 13 years. When they are Adolescent, very young, they migrate. So by the age of 21 years, when they reach at the age of 21 years, they become the breadwinner of the family. So when they become the breadwinner of the family, family ask them to marry. So usually they marry to a girl who is less than the legal age of marriage, that is 14 or 15 year girl. And there are thousands of incidences that the young girl marry at the age of 15 years, become mother at the age of 16 years. I am talking about uh, motherhood during childhood and become you know at the age of 18 19 years there are thousands of incidences so I have seen the self stigma among the young adolescents young adolescent mothers what are the state self stigma there is always a fear that they will die there is always a fear that what will happen to their children there is always a fear that there is there are always being blamed by the male parts of the in-laws that sees the career and she spread the virus to their son. And there is, because of this thing, they don't access, they don't disclose the status that they are HIV positive. Ultimately, they don't go to the ART center for registration. Even if they go to the ART center for registration, they don't go regularly to take the medicine. Ultimately, it creates a negative adherence, what we say drug resistance or negative adherence. That resulted in thousands of deaths. Thousands of children become orphan in a particular part. I'm talking, and you know, in India, the major drive of HIV spread is migration. There is no cause and effect relationship, but the drive is migration. So migrants, their spouses, and the self-stigma among the spouses, leading innocent women and children to death. Okay. Um I'm so happy that I have someone from India who is working with the HIV positive uh, people. I was in India um, uh, 2015 and I went on to volunteer to some HIV uh, organizations. Uh, SATI was one of them and Desire Society was one of them which um, looks after HIV positive uh, children. And I was uh, so touched. I don't know about your organization, but um, the children at um, Desire Society, it's like... Uh, they are just there, uh, they are given food, they are given um, um, a place to stay, but um, because of their status, uh, they are HIV uh, positive. Even the people at the school, they are like, they have this uh, environment where you feel like they are just there, just to keep them alive until um, waiting for them to die. They are not um, going to school. Uh, they are just there, like they wake up in the morning, they have food, they play, and they. Uh, when I was there, I was teaching some of the young girls some um, uh, English lessons, and uh, I, I just want to know what are, what is your organization doing to make sure that um, uh, these children who are born with HIV and are at your, your institute, uh, you capacitate them, you 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 empower them so that. Um, if they live to up to 50 years, what are they going to do? Because there's going to be a time when you are going to say, okay, you are 18 years uh, old. We can no longer keep you at this uh, the school. You have to go in the world and uh, uh, look after yourself. As your organization, what are you doing for those uh, kids? Thank you. We registered for the program for the uh, children and adolescents in this program. First, we uh, my our uh, objective is uh, they are registered at the ART center and get the service from hospital and health center. We monitor to adherence, uh, care, and provide the pediatric counseling for the peace and uh, joyful to the children. We provide the nutrition and hygiene for the adolescents. And uh, uh, in the Durban, I attend uh, so many uh, sessions for the adolescents and we, we plan for the peer educator model uh, for the, our uh, beneficiaries.
How many children are there? Uh, we have a 116 uh, children we adopted for this program. And this program have a no government fund, no international agency fund, no big uh, agency, funding agency in India, not fund. But this program is run by local donors. They are from business, some small businessmen, small industrialists, farmer, and household women. They are donated cash and kind for this uh, program. Benjamin would like to say something. Yes, I, I was. Uh, I, I, thanks for everyone. I, I, I think we had a wide array of presentations. I was thinking as it was going on, what would Nadine say if she was here? <laughs> <laughs> and I think I know what Nadine Ferris France would say. I think she would say that. Uh, what we've seen today is that these ideas of exploring self-stigma are not luxury ideas. These are core issues. They're really essential issues that we pay attention to. And I know she would like to point out that it's almost invisible amongst uh, the community response to HIV. How often do people hear about we hear a lot about stigma, but we don't talk about internal stigma or self-stigma. I think she would also point out that we had some very vivid examples of people's own experience of self-stigma, how they got out of it. And then we had some very vivid examples of how people respond in, in their work. Uh, there's some very r intense work that was presented by Masimba. Uh, Cloudy gave some very good examples of th that same experiential work with, with Byron Katie. And then I'd like to point out that Sophie has embodied this work and internalized it into a project that she's already doing. So I think it's important to recognize that there are lots of ways to do this from either sort of a small, medium, or large context. And so it shouldn't be too mystified. It's essential that people begin to do this. And I think as advocates, it's our responsibility to challenge people and ask them, what are you doing about this? Rather than yammering on about how terrible stigma is, what are you doing about enabling people to uh, respond to it? Thank you, Benjamin. You have summed it up so beautifully for all of us. And thanks. And I'm sure each one of us is leaving this room by giving whatever we had inside us to somebody else. Thank you, Sophie, for that.